we are active. Great, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today for the KRU conference session, Happily Ever After. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Donna Frazier, Program Manager for KRU and Senior Vice President of Privacy Initiatives here at BBB National Programs. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So um, this is our fifth session for the KRU 2020 conference. For those of you who have been on before, you're familiar with this housekeeping screen. I just want to remind everybody that your microphones are muted. Um, the session is being recorded and will be available online. And if at any time during the session you require technical help, please email support at bbbnp.org. Um, you can submit questions um, in the chat and I will be monitoring that throughout the conversation. Um, we have three sessions remaining after this one um, in October, November, and December. The next one um, in October is featuring Michael Moynihan from LEGO talking about um, how they forge their own path um, to maintain compliance. And I would encourage you to sign up for all of um, the remaining sessions for the year. This program, like all of them, is not possible without our sponsors. So I would like to give uh, thanks to all of them, Google, Hypershift, Keller and Heckman, Microsoft, Super Awesome, Venable, Monat, Baker Hostetler, and of course, last but not least, Davis and Gilbert. So um, I don't think we could have attained better speakers for today's subject matter um, other than Phyllis um, and Pater. So both of whom many of you know, however, I will briefly introduce them for those of you who are unfamiliar. Um, Phyllis is a partner at Hunt and Andrews Kurth heading the firm's advertising counseling practice. Phyllis's practice includes um, claim creation and substantiation, among other things. And she also counsels clients on the intricacies and of complying with COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Uh, many of you know that prior to joining the firm, Phyllis was at the Federal Trade Commission and Chief of Staff for Advertising Practices and leader of the FTC's Children's Privacy Enforcement Program. Um, Phyllis, it dawned on me today that we probably started working together in 2007. So, <laughs> um, Peter McGee is um, a senior attorney in the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection at the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection. And he works on a variety of privacy litigation and policy matters. Um, but most importantly, for those of us in the COPPA space, he is one of the go-to people at the FTC for us um, today when we have questions, burning questions, hypotheticals, and uh, just basic complaints about COPPA and the rule. So I will turn it over to Phyllis and Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Well, I think it is kind of rare when you have a panel that features two friends and colleagues, and um, at least up until, gosh, Peter, five years ago, really close work partners. And um, when I stopped, uh, co-leading the children's privacy program, we kind of seamlessly handed it off to Peter and Peter then took it and ran with it. So what we thought we would bring to our audience today was a um, two people from the inside then from the outside, tell it like it is <clears throat> back and forth fireside chat. So Peter and I are going to um, throw burning questions at each other and um, we'll encourage people listening in to send their burning questions as well. We have someone monitoring the chat. Um, so feel free to, to jump in when you'd like. I'll start off and Peter and I are gonna rotate. Um, Peter, my first question to you is why the FTC decided in 2019 to reopen the COPPA rule review. We had been talking about what we were calling the new and the revised rule uh, that went into effect in 2013, and it didn't seem that long ago. Um, and we we're, we were still calling it new, and you guys decided to take another look. Why was that? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for, for having me, and um, great to be on the panel, Phyllis. Um, before I answer, I have to give the caveat that my comments today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the commission or any individual commissioners. No, you're just here and me <laughs> and Peter, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, <laughs> with that said, um, yeah, it, it's true that the FTC typically uh, reviews its rules every 10 years. 
Um, but I think given that COPPA pertains to online privacy, it's necessarily entwined with technology and business models that change and evolve uh, quite rapidly. And because of this, the commission determined that it made sense to undertake a, a review before uh, the 10 years had passed since we last amended the rule, as you say, in 2013. Although keep in mind that um, the process actually started for the, for the last uh, review in 2010 uh, with a, a, a public workshop. It went through a notice of proposed rulemaking and a supplemental notice of propo proposed rulemaking with public comments. Um, and, and the amendments weren't effective into the summer of 2013. But um, I don't think we're that far off that sort of 10 year rule of thumb uh, review time period. Fair enough. What uh, do you got for me? Okay. Uh, I'm going to pull up your questions. Um, just bear with me for a second. Sorry about that. Um, so, well, um, what were the, uh, let, let, let's go back to 2013 or really 2010. What were the burning questions? at the time of the last rule review for, uh, for, the, for the FTC's team back when you were running the rule? Well, I think back then the rule review was born out of two things. First was the passage of time since the original rule had gone into effect. It had been reviewed in the interim, but only small parts of it. Um, and then there was, to be honest with you, the need to do some cleanup and so, uh, you know, we thought that the time was right. Once we got into it, um, the key issue became the question of expanding the rule to cover the collection of persistent identifiers used for profile creation and online behavioral targeting. And then kind of the, the companion to that was how we could define support for internal operations to give some relief to operators for permissible uses while expanding the rule pretty significantly. And I think some would say kind of seismically in its definitions. Sure. Does that resonate with you? It does. And um, I, I think um, we'll, we'll be touching upon um, some of the, the, those I guess issues, um, behavioral advertising, persistent identifiers, and, and how those have, have played out since, since the 2013 amendments. So I know you're not going to say we got it 100% right. You're never going <laughs> to give that to us. Um, so what would you say the burning questions are right now? In, well, when you started in 2019 and now we're into the fall of 2020. Sure. Um, well, first, let me say, um, I, I, I think the calls in 2013 were, were the right ones. Um, and um, at the same time, um, and, and I guess we'll get into this, they're, they're, they have created some challenges, uh, both from an enforcement standpoint and an implementation for, the, for industry. Um, but I, I think the, the burning questions uh, driving our current review um, for some of the bigger issues that we um, sought comment on and we're currently exploring. Um, the first is probably whether the rules factors for determining whether a website or online service is directed to children, whether those factors still work. Um, as you know, in the rule, we, we lay out a number of factors that the commission considers in determining whether something is child directed or not. Um, and we've asked whether those factors need to be clarified, um, whether there are any additional factors that should be considered. Um, so that, that's, I th and, and I think that's one area where uh, there are challenges um, in determining whether something is child directed. So we're looking at that. Um, I, I think another uh, one of the big issues is how COPPA should apply in the school context, including when and how schools can provide consent on behalf of parents and how operators who rely on that consent can use the data they collect. 
costs. Um, another issue we've teed up was how to encourage general audience platforms that feature child-directed content that's uploaded by third parties, so where they don't have any control over creation of the content. Um, whether there are ways to create incentives for those platforms to take steps to identify and police uh, the, the content on their platforms. Um, so I, the, I think those are th th sort of three big issues. Um, there obviously were some, as you mentioned in 2013, some housekeeping type things, some, some smaller things, but I think those are some of the big ones that yeah. were those are huge issues, actually. I don't, um, I don't envy your task as, as you read through the comments <laughs> and think through, you know, the cuts you might make. Um, so I think, you know, I guess what, what we've shown is that there's not necessarily a reason to wait 10 years. If there are burning, pressing developments in the interim, you can get kind of close enough to do a rule review as needed. Yeah, and and again, given um, that it does, it, it's it's not an immediate thing. The process takes time. You you have to you have to put out the questions. Um, you get comments back. You've got to you know we you've got to review the you've got to review the the comments uh, and, and and consider the analysis and and have a reasoned uh, uh, response to to the arguments that are made um, for and against certain changes. So it, it does take time. Um, so next question for you. Yes. Um, looking back on the last rule review um, from your new uh, perspective, is there anything that you think you would have done differently, uh, or cuts you would have made differently, or have things turned out in such a way where you think, oh, I wish we hadn't done it that way? I don't think there's anything that I wish we hadn't done. And I appreciate your saying that you think, you know, the cuts we made um, in 2013 were the right ones. I do think, looking back, there are some things that, that maybe we could have done differently, especially from, a, from the viewpoint of implementation. Um, I think we could have been more specific about the types of activities that fall under support for internal operations. I think there was some ambiguity and some wiggle room, and I think you're seeing in the current set of comments that people are asking for more specificity, either as, a, as an expansion or just as a clarification. So I, I think that's one area where it would have been helpful. I think another area um, maybe even a wholesale re, rethinking, I'm going to go out there on a limb, is um, in consent mechanisms. I think, I think there's a lot of work to be done there in implementing consent mechanisms that work well more seamlessly and still give you the assurance that the kind of lead in provision to the rule is seeking, you know, the assurance that the individual you're interacting with is the parent or guardian of the child. Um, we kind of stuck to the old list and the old, there's, a, there's a lot clunky and old school about the list of consent mechanisms. And even though the commission has said a number of times, you know, if you meet the standard of reasonably designed to give you that assurance, it can pass muster. People are really kind of wedded to and hate that old list of consent mechanisms. And so, I wonder if we shouldn't have, you know, re rethought an approach there. Um, gosh, and then of course there's the matter of that footnote in the statement of basis and purpose regarding platforms and actual knowledge. And I know we'll talk about YouTube, and um, we certainly didn't mean to make complications for you in the enforcement. <laughs> arena. That's a little bit of inside baseball for all of you who are listening and YouTube seems to have come out nonetheless, but you know, sometimes you write things and there are some unintended consequences. So is that fair, Peter? Yeah, I think that is fair. Uh, and um, it, it does, it does add to the challenge of uh, making changes to a rule where 
and, and we've seen this at times with the FAQs the commission puts out, uh, you, would, you intend to address a specific issue, concern, problem, and you think you, you have addressed that, and lo and behold, uh, you've now created some additional questions. Um, so yeah, that, that can be tricky. In, in implementing the rule since 2013, um, what, what are the biggest challenges that you have found, either in offering advice to operators who I assume are still calling you or their counsel for implementation um, guidance, or as you're setting about to enforce the rule against violators or potential violators? Yeah, um, well, I, I can highlight some, um, some areas where we get a lot of questions from operators. Um, so first, I, and, and you, um, you mentioned this, um, I, I, the f first area where we get a lot is um, on support for internal operations exception. Um, and in particular, the line between what's considered personalization uh, which fits within the exception, and what constitutes creating a profile. Um, that, that's a question we get a lot, uh, and I think there is a fair amount of, of gray um, about that. Um, I don't think that line is necessarily a bright one. Um, you know, some, some advice we've given or examples uh, would be things like keeping a score in a game or say a volume setting adjustment uh, in, in an app as opposed to, and, and that would be more on the side of personalization as opposed to, you know, promoting or marketing product apps based on the activities the consumer has uh, been engaged in. That would tend to fall more over on the side of, of creating a profile. Um, we and, uh, you know, I mentioned this is one of the areas we teed up, but we get a lot of questions about how COPPA works in the school context. And what we say is um, it's up to the operator to comply with COPPA. It's, it's, it's not the school's obligation. Um, and an operator can rely on, on school consent, but it's limited in what it can do with the information it collects where that's the consent mechanism. Um, the collections must be used for the use and benefit of the school and uh, for no other commercial purposes. And then a, a third area that um, has, generates questions is how the mixed audience concept fits into COPPA, how it works. And mixed audience sites are, and I think people sometimes don't understand this, Mixed audience sites are a subset of child directed. So um, it's, but it's one that target, it, it, the site or the service targets children under the age of 13, but that group isn't the primary audience. Um, for instance, your site also targets adults or older teens. If you're in that category, you can collect age information and then extend COPPA protections only to those users who identify as younger than 13, and you can treat the other users as 13 and above where COPPA wouldn't apply. So those are three areas where I would say we get a fair amount of uh, questions and there's a fair amount of confusion. Um, in, in terms of the challenges for us in enforcing the 2013 um, or the rule as amended in 2013, um, they, they sort of track some of those question areas. Um, but one, one challenge uh, on persistent identifiers, which were covered in 2013, uh, persistent identifiers on their own, not linked with anything else, um, it, it, it can be difficult to determine whether a site or service is collecting a persistent identifier for permissible internal operations or it's using it for behavioral advertising, which would not be permitted under the exception. That's not always uh, clear, just um, 
looking at the site or even, you know, using some of the investigatory tools that we, we have at our disposal. Um, mixed audience site, um, the challenge for us probably there is determining at what point a site or service becomes mixed audience, where, it, you know, what's, what's the line between being mixed audience and being primarily targeted to children. Uh, again, it's a subset, but it, um, that, can be, that can be a challenge figuring out when you've crossed over from mixed audience to purely child directed or vice versa. And then um, another challenge I, is, is applying COPPA to the Internet of Things connected devices, um, where, where a device collects personal data from very young uh, children. But it's, it's the parent who sets up the device, is aware of, and intends for that, that collection of information. In that context, how does verifiable parental consent work? Uh, what makes sense there? And um, you know, that, that's, a, that's an area where I think there's, um, where there's some confusion and maybe a changing landscape a little bit. I think it's your All turn right. to ask I've, me, I've although I'm dying to ask you another question. <laughs> All right, have at it. Uh, well, we're going to stick to our taking turns. Uh, okay. We don't have to. Um, All right, so here's one. Uh, are there changes that the commission made in 2013 that you think were particularly prescient? For example, including audio. Um, I, I think when that change went into effect, we didn't have the smart speakers as ubiquitously as we do now. Right. Oh, no, it, we, we, were, we were all, everything was brilliant, Peter. We just, we looked ahead. <laughs> now, you know, we didn't, we didn't know, but we suspected. And I think we wanted to be as expansive as possible. And, you know, at the time, the rule covered photographs, but only photographs in, in which the subject matter or the subject shown in the photograph had some identifying information. You know, they were wearing a t-shirt, uh, proclaiming the name of their elementary school, for example, or standing next to their, you know, street sign. Um, at, and that distinction didn't make a lot of sense. So, you know, kind of removing the qualifiers from photograph. Um, it, there's that famous kid's book, you know, if you give a mouse a cookie, so yeah. <laughs> once you once you removed you know the the qualifications from photograph, well, let's talk about audio. Let's talk about video. And so um, I, I think we were ahead of our time because we didn't really anticipate IoT devices then or voice activated connected devices. Um, and so I'll I'll take it you know on prescience there. Um, I think mixed audience, there was a big push for it. I think a lot of participants in this call today, you know, were among those who were um, pushing for mixed audience and then grateful for it after the fact. I think if we kind of opened up and panned on the audience right now, we would hear that people, you know, have viewed that as um, some relief and that it, it helps to, to sort your audience, um, your user base in, in good ways. Um, so I would say those, two were, you know, especially forward looking, left unanswered at the time, although I remember we kind of listed them, were things like, um, you know, interactive gaming and um, smart televisions. And so I think, you know, you leave that for another day and that, that next day is here. And, uh, you know, and for you guys to think through whether there is room in the rule to address those kinds of technologies or through guidance to talk about how CABA applies. So, you know, among the things you guys are considering and, and you had said um, was the definition of directed to children. And I'm sure among the 175,000 comments that you have received are comments that this expansion of a definition of directed to children um, is going to go a step too far 
or could go a step too far. For example, it could move you into an area where you could be um, looking at sites and services where perhaps you should know that, you know, that kids abound. Um, and a couple of your cases last year used, uh, there are a lot of kids here standard as among the factors that the commission considered in determining whether uh, a, the site or service was directed to children. Do you think it's fair to say you are walking on a little bit of interesting ice here or, or not? <laughs> um, yeah, the ice is always interesting. Uh, <laughs> it, well, I will say that um, I understand that there's a, a tendency to sort of read the tea leaves and uh, it's, it probably goes beyond that when you've actually asked questions and sought comments on certain things. Um, but I will say that the commission has not proposed any changes to the definition at this point. Um, we're, we're still uh, considering the comments that the commission received on, um, on the issue of um, directed, the definition of directed to children, uh, along with all the comments on the other issues that we, we asked. Um, and I will note that in asking that question about the definition, um, we noted that uh, any change would have to be consistent with the COPPA statute. And the, the COPPA statute does define uh, directed to children. And I, I do think there, um, there is some legislative history uh, about actual knowledge, constructive knowledge. Um, so it, anything that would the commission would, would do would have to be consistent with the statute. So if there is concern that we're, um, we're, we're potentially uh, overreaching, I think it's a little premature right now um, at, at, this, at this stage of the game. And, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll hear a response to whatever is proposed. So if, if anything. Ah. Okay, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna ask a follow-up question because you just opened the door a teeny tiny little bit. So you just said, if anything, is there a possibility that the rule will remain as is after this effort? Well, I, um, you know, we're, we're, in, <laughs> we're in the preliminary stages um, and I don't wanna get ahead of, of anything, but uh, it, it is a rule review, we have not, Commission has not put forth uh, a notice of proposed changes to anything yet. Um, so, it, it, you know, I, I can't answer that right now. Um, what 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 the next step will be, other than to say that if there are proposed changes, that, as in prior uh, reviews, we'll, we would put those out and. Um, uh, solicit public comment on any proposed changes. And, um, and, and I think back uh, when you all amended the rule, there were some cuts that you initially made that you then changed your mind on based on the response from the public. So right. um, it, this is potentially, if something is proposed to change, this is potentially a multi-step process. That won't necessarily be that, but if Asked his prologue in 2013. I think you had uh, you had the notice of proposed rulemaking and then a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking and some changes between the two and ultimately where the commission finally ended up. So I guess you're not going right. to tell us when we can expect even the next articulation. Well, I don't have a uh, <laughs> I don't have a, a specific time frame. I will say we're working very hard on, um, you know, going through all the comments, considering the the arguments made, uh, the the suggestions, and um, we, we are um, in the process of weighing what to do next based on the feedback we got from the wide array of, of stakeholders who uh, 
responded to our call for comments. And there was quite a response. I think uh, around 175,000 comments. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty strong uh, turnout. Uh, okay, let me. While you're thinking yeah, about the next question, know. I'll say you hit a nerve. <laughs> Apparently, I, I don't uh, off the top of my head know the number of comments received to the 2013 review. It wasn't 175,000. Um, yeah, I suspect not. And having worked on other things that were open for public comment, that, that is a pretty high response. Okay. Um, all right. Um, in, in the last review and amendment, the commission, as you know, added persistent identifiers to the definition of personal information. Do you think that was the right call? And how do you think that addition has affected the availability of children's online content and operators monetization of that content? Which I think of as sort of going hand in glove since People put content out there usually in order to monetize it so that they can do it as a yeah they're able to afford to do it. Alex Trebek, I'm gonna go. Oh, not Alex Trebek. Who's the one? Steve Harvey, Family Feud. I'm going with yes. It was the right answer then and now. Um, no, I, I do think it was the right call. I'm sure lots of listeners want to shoot daggers through me right now, um, but it is what it is, guys. It's been in effect since 2013. Um, you know, has it affected monetization opportunities? I think, you know, the groundswell of uh, complaint after your YouTube case probably would show you that for a not insubstantial segment of uh, creators who are offering digital content, it, it complicates the scenario. Now, you know, it, it surprised me a little bit, you know, the um, immediacy of the response um, or the portion of the response that seemed to indicate that this was a new, a new rule. It might have been a new application, but not a new rule. Um, but there, you know, there were real people and real content affected by that. Um, do I think you can do it differently? Yes, you know, and, and, and I'll, I'll stick with that as well. Has it diminished? children's online content I don't I don't know you know we heard over time there's always been the prediction of the internet's demise right or the internet for children's demise and um, we never really saw data to to support that but I think there has been probably um, a consolidation in, in the industry and you know you have certain players or certain players in the industry offering a lot of content and maybe uh, smaller players offering less. But then again, you know, the app marketplace was burgeoning, you know, somewhat fledgling, but, and, and, but growing and grew exponentially after um, 2013. So I would have to go with, I don't think it negatively affected the children's ecosystem, but you know, Lots of other people listening could say, you yeah, know, no, fellas, it's, of course it has, it's, you know, it's ruined us. And I think, you know, a huge portion of your 175,000 comments to the FTC in relation to this rule review will say just that. Yeah, um, it, it, I know that that was, uh, if not controversial, at least, uh, well, it's, yeah, I think it was controversial um, for some people in adding a persistent identifier um, uh, on its own um, as, as to, the, to the definition of, of personal information. And, and <clears throat> we have heard concerns about how that uh, will affect the availability of content. Um, I mean, it, I know it was consequential. It, I, I'm not meaning to say it wasn't, and it wasn't unlikely. Um, and it, what we refined the coverage over time, and, and that's what you mentioned earlier. You know, the scope was kind of tightened between the first proposed uh, re 
the, the first proposal by the commission and what ultimately went into effect. But, you know, the expansion of COPPA to cover behavioral advertising was really built on the shoulders of the commission's own work done in reviewing behavioral targeting and thinking through um, what kind of notification recipients um, of behaviorally targeted ads might be given. And there was always an articulation that children um, were you know, a special category in there. So COPPA provided the vehicle to make sure that children were protected from this part of the marketing world. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, having worked on uh, the, the commission's um, uh, principles on behavioral advertising, it seems to be a logical continuation of, of that policy call um, I, I think our OBA principles came out a year or two before you started the, the rule review in 2010, and um, I, I think it would have been difficult not to have expanded the definition of personal information after the commission had sort of marked out that territory uh, previously. I think that's right. So, you know, it, it is difficult to implement. I think you're probably going to ask me that at some point, so I'll just jump in and answer that <laughs> question. You know, what what are you seeing now that you didn't see when you were at the commission? Um, it comes hard. <laughs> it's really hard. I always say it's this pokey little statute, right, that takes up like four pages if you print it out, um, and the rule is short, but there is a lot packed in there. It's dense like plutonium, and it's ever changing, and it's and you know, clients and operators and, and companies and developers um, don't come to you with the easy questions. You know, they come to you with the hard questions, right? There's kind of a baseline level of knowledge and then there's, I wanna develop this program. And, um, you know, sometimes um, it, the, the, the challenges look like law school exams, right? You're gonna hit every single issue in, in an inquiry. Um, you know, a few, things that I grapple with, um, for, that, that our clients grapple with, is the question of, you know, who's the operator when you've got multiple parties touching data? That, that one's been a very tough one. Um, you know, one example is where you've got the developer of the IoT device, you've got um, the data processor, you know, servicing the, um, the, the digital aspects of that device, and then you've got other parties kind of weaving in and out um, of that service. So that, you know, that I've kind of, you know, twist my brain around. Um, another area is actual knowledge. It, you know, kind of when do you get it? And, and what does it look like? And um, in that area, maybe you caught some people off guard in your YouTube case. I know we haven't talked too much about it here, but you know, at least you expanded in Musical.ly and in YouTube what the commission would, well, Musical.ly, music is a little, little different, but YouTube, you know, what the commission would consider to be actual knowledge and, and all the indicia that would add up there. Um, that, that, that those two things alone can keep you um, from getting Alzheimer's. <laughs> well, thanks. I, I was going to ask you um, from your your new perspective um, if there were particular sort of your particular challenges being on the other side now. Um, what are the really thorny uh, issues you have to deal with in, in representing clients that are trying to navigate this space? And and I will say, um, you know, we have um, our COPPA hotline and. The, uh, we receive countless emails through that. We get calls from practitioners and uh, companies, and and the questions are, you know, it, it's it's incredibly hard because someone will call you up with a question, and and the the scenario is difficult to understand, <laughs> to follow, um, and you're trying to apply the rule on the spot to 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 a scenario you just you couldn't have dreamed up yourself. Um, it, it, and as you say, the rule is deceptively short uh, and simple. And when you try to apply it out, it, it, can be, it can be challenging. 
Right. I have a activated robot that you run through the television <laughs> that senses my child's, you know, sleep pattern. I don't know. I could sure. make it yeah. up, right? That's totally guided by parents. However, records my child all night long, right? I, I, I could keep on going. Um, so you're still running the hotline. That's good to know. Um, this, you know, that, that open door policy predated me by a lot. And I think it's one of the real gems of the agency and somewhat unusual that, you know, you can actually call and get a live person and bounce some ideas off of, you know, a, a person, not a bot. Um, but that said, you know, not everyone and not even large companies are comfortable calling the FTC. You know, a, a lot of people, that's still an uncomfortable interaction. But I would think, you know, everybody would benefit from the advice that you give. Have you given any thought to how you might make your thinking more transparent? Your advice more transparent? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, let me just at the outset stress that we do have an open door policy for top advice. And uh, I believe you that there are companies and, and, and folks out there that are hesitant to contact us, but there are a lot of people that aren't because we feel, we field a fair number of calls uh, and get a lot of inquiries through the, the, HOPA, <laughs> through the COPPA hotline. Um, and, you know, we try to be as responsive and as transparent in our thinking as we can. And, um, you know, I can't say that the team hasn't missed an occasional email or maybe not gotten back to a practitioner who calls as quickly as we'd always like, but we do our best to be as responsive as we can and, and to, to follow up when we get questions. Um, we also engage in um, a, a lot of outreach um, where we try to raise awareness and, and understanding of the rule uh, we have a variety of publicly available materials uh, that includes uh, a document called the COPPA FAQs, which has been accessed um, thousands upon thousands of times. Uh, we recently updated uh, the FAQs um, to clean up some things um, and, and to hopefully provide some more guidance. Uh, we have a six-step uh, compliance guideline for, for companies to sort of a simple um, flow chart really to see if COPPA applies to you and if so how, how, how you can comply with it. Uh, we we um, do consumer, um, not consumer, we do blogs that we put up on the website dealing with specific issues. Uh, for instance, we did a, a, a blog following the announcement of our YouTube case last fall, where we tried to provide some more guidance to content creators in how to make a determination of whether their content is child-directed. Um, so I, I think we, the, the, the public outreach and the guidance are a big part of our COPPA program, in addition to our, you know, bringing uh, bringing cases in, in, in law enforcement um, and we really do uh, treat that component seriously and, and put a lot of uh, effort into it. But um, that being said, uh, there are probably always ways to improve. So maybe I can turn around. The oh, I have some ideas. <laughs> well, the, and, and that's what I'm going to ask <laughs> is if you, um, if you have ideas and, uh, and can think of ways that we should be or could be more transparent or do a better job at communicating with stakeholders. Um, I'm all ears now and uh, would love to hear it. Oh, good. I see Donna. Uh, I know she, uh, think she wants to ask questions, but Donna, I'm going to give them two pieces of advice and then you can pop in. Okay. Peter, I thought of two areas in preparing for this day. Um, okay. Consider them, you know, for, I think they're worth something, but um, okay. So there have been times when the FTC has given advice to someone who has come seeking it. And that advice um, kind of through the rumor mill, people hear that, you know, thus and such would not fly at the FTC or thus and such conversely has been approved by the FTC. It's really hard to get a handle on that. 
And I'm wondering if there might not be a mechanism for you to publicize or make more transparent the key advice that you've given, especially where it might have a broader application than just the company who comes to you anonymously or not seeking input. That's, that's one area. I think that would be pretty useful. Another area is maybe seeking some feedback on new FAQs that industry and parents and advocates, you know, everybody who has a stake in this, um, might want to see answered by the FTC. It had been a long time since the FAQs were were changed. You know, they kind of sat um, they sat there static for a while. And I think what you guys did in in rearranging them and reorganizing them and get ri getting rid of or updating, you know, outdated ones was terrific. Um, but but thinking through the possibility of getting feedback about what you might be answering could be useful. Well, I think that's uh, the thanks for the um, the suggestions. Um, with respect to the first, um, I will just say that I think there can be times where if if staff gets a call and we try to answer a, a hypothetical, uh, you know. I have a client, I can't tell you who it is, but this is kind of what they're doing. And we're wondering if this would fly, I, you know, what we, what we have to say is we will give you our sort of reaction to your hypothetical. We are not the commissioners and this is not before the commission and this is not what the commission would necessarily do, but we will give you our best sort of take on our insight based on our experience enforcing the rule, what we think, how, you know, whether something would work or not, or, or be okay under the law. Um, and I, I think there may be some misinterpretation sometimes or not full disclosure in the hypothetical and maybe it's a little different. And, um, you know, that, that may cause some of the confusion out there. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how to resolve that, um, if we are going to engage with with, with companies that, and, and anyone, I mean, it's not just companies; it's individuals, it's parents who contact us as well. Um, on your second point, I, th I think that's a great idea, um, and it's something we'll we'll uh, I'll take back to my colleagues and, and give that some thought. Um, it, 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 as you know, and as I said, we we did recently update the FAQs. It, it is not a uh, it is not a small endeavor, and um, as I said earlier, sometimes when when you're putting out information, you think you're answering a question, and you are, but you're creating three more questions. But um, the idea of soliciting input um, from stakeholders is, uh, is intriguing, and um, if there are specific issues uh, that we should address in the FAQs that everyone. Is, is uh, calling for that. That might be good to know. Fair so we have yeah. a couple of questions in the queue. Yeah. So one goes back to something that you said earlier, Phyllis, which was really about user-generated content, specifically the platforms who don't have control over what content gets uploaded. Um, would we continue to ask platforms to use content as a signal of who's a child? or ask the platform to look at the user and what information they have about the user to determine you know, what they understand and how they can control them. I think this was Peter who said that. Peter, I'm throwing this over to you. I mean, you guys have opened up that question in the rule review in part mm -hmm. when you are looking at whether there's a way to sort users either through login or some other you know, uh, affirmation or attestation of who they are. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I follow the question exactly, but um, I mean, looking at the YouTube case, um, there you, um, well, in that case, the case was against YouTube, the platform, um, and, and it was because YouTube had actual knowledge of the child direct that there was child directed content on the platform and because 
it was collecting personal information from the users of that content with the actual knowledge of the content, uh, they were on the hook. And that was, that is the first time I believe we used that uh, theory of liability. And that came out of the 2013 amendments where if you're a third party and you're a general audience third party, but you're collecting personal information from users of a website or service where you have actual knowledge that that website or service is child directed, then you in, in effect take ownership of that child directed uh, site or service and you, you have liability under COMPA for the, the collection. So I guess part of the question is, should content be what leads the investigation with regards to how you're determining whether or not children are watching, right? So if it's, is it just merely about it appearing to be child-directed, the content? Because let's say it's not child-directed, however, there's, there's actual knowledge, there's evidence that other children, that children are engaging, but it's not what you would traditionally view as child-directed content. Um, so are we looking at expanding what those eight factors are essentially, right? Um, to determine what's child-directed. But is, is content always going to be the one that leads? Um, well, we, we are, you know, we are looking at the definition of, of child-directed and whether the factors that we currently have need to be uh, added to or clarified. Um, so I, I don't want to get ahead of that process. Um, th that is one of the, the issues that's up in the rule review and we have received, uh, comments on that and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where, we'll see where we end up. So one of the other questions, which I think you're considering as well is expanding ways to get verifiable parental consent, VBC, v -V -P -C. Um, digital signatures being considered, or any other things that, that you think we could be looking at? He's not going to tell uh, you, Anna. <laughs> it's uh, his, opinion. Yeah, the, his opinion. I'm asking for Peter's opinion. <laughs> the uh, we, we have received, I, I believe there are some comments that um, uh, have, have touched upon different uh, methods of, of getting VPC. Um, it, again, I, I'm sorry to, you know, to dodge, but I just don't want to say too much about the next steps um, because we're not there yet. Right. Uh, and so it's, um, you know, it, it's definitely a, a relevant uh, issue. And um, again, I, I think there are comments dealing with it um, and we'll see. So I think for those in the audience who weren't around for the, you know, the 2010, 2013 period, um, I just want to put it a little bit of this in context and take some heat off of you, Peter, which is, um, you know, back in 2010, Phyllis, we talked about this the other day, less than 500 comments came in, right? And the process started in 2010 and culminated in 2013 with it going to effect in July of 2014. Um, in December, you received over 175,000 comments. Um, and the breadth, I just want people to understand the breadth of this, right? That if we received under less than 500, and we made some significant changes, you all made some significant changes, material changes in 2010. Um, and I, I don't anticipate there being any less material changes this time around, but I think people need to understand that this is going to take some time. Um, just going through the comments, um, substantive or not, I, every comment has to be looked at, right, Peter? You can't ignore yeah. any. So I, I think it's just important for people to understand that, the process, um, that we should not be expecting anything in 2021. Um, I mean, maybe 2022. I can be hopeful. We can well, I, I I don't have a uh, I don't have a timeline that I can, I can share with anyone, but I, I will say that we um, we treat the, the public comment component uh, extremely seriously. We we get great comments. We want them. It helps inform 
um, the recommendation staff will make to the commission. And um, it, it's an important part of the process. Uh, and we're working very hard to uh, move the, the review along uh, as quickly and as thoroughly as we can. So Phyllis, I'm gonna to toss one more question out to you before we close out, which is, you know, hindsight's 2020. Um, if you look back 20 years um, from the initial draft of the rule, um, anything that you would have put in or not put in at the outset? I don't know if I would have not put things in. I think I would have given greater weight in terms of specific details to the security and the data minimization provisions of the rule, they're there, mm -hmm. but they're not fleshed out. And they come kind of second to a lot of, um, a whole kind of rubric of notice and consent requirements. So even just flipping the order in some way might have changed things you know, just to show that it's not just a notice and consent uh, regime. Because mm -hmm. um, I think there's some real substance that gets lost. Now, the FTC has brought some cases right. around um, at least the security. Mm -hmm. Pedro, I'm not sure if there's been a data min minimization case or not. Um, but the rule was born out of the idea that you know, operators shouldn't go fishing right. for for data to um, to let the kids get to the good stuff. So I, I've always thought there there was more there that could be made of that. That said, I really like the practicality of COPPA. I think when we've seen you know the GDPR spring up, um, laws in other jurisdictions, um, it there's not. Like nobody knows what to do. You know what the principles are, but you don't know kind of if I first I put one foot in front of the other and then I walk and then I do this. Like COPPA tells you how to do that. Right. And so at least there's a scaffolding and a structure there. Mm -hmm. um, it's much harder to design around a conceptual statute mm -hmm. than it is around something like COPPA. So, you know, well, who was that guy on Saturday Night Live? Like, gosh, darn it. <laughs> I like it. I mean, you know, it sounds it sounds goofy, but at least um, there there's some practicality there. And as lawyers, we like we like the practicality. Now we've talked about this over the years that you know I do appreciate how nimble the law is, and um, you know I'm a fan of the mixed audience solution. So um, don't remove that, Peter. Keep the mixed <laughs> audience, please. Um, I want to thank both of you um, for the conversation. Say this was really helpful very engaging. I think a lot of people um, gleaned a lot of insight into, you know, not just where we're going, but where we've been. And that's really important as we move forward. Um, I want to go back to our, our slide deck briefly. Um, so just um, for those of you um, who are attending, I just want to make you aware that we are launching um, a teenage privacy program. It's called TAP. Um, we are seeking founding members. This is not KRU for teens, but instead a a pledge-like program where we're going to develop core principles and industry standards for the teenage um, space. And part of that is defining what is a teenager um, and starting at 13 and where do we go, 16, 17, 18. There is a um, landscape of state laws that um, define teens differently. So um, we're looking to address this space, um, not just both here domestically, but um, globally as well. So if you're interested, please do reach out to us. Um, we have, um, KBU has a Kivertizing event coming up in November, uh, November 18th and 19th. This is a two hour event over two days, um, two, two hours each day. Um, and it is run by uh, my staff on day one. Um, my senior staff attorney, Katie Goldstein, will talk about um, K rule and advertising, and on day two, Angela Tiffin will discuss um, K rule and privacy. So um, this is really kind of a K rule one on one session to learn about what we do, how we do it, and how you stay out of the crosshairs of, of both us and, and the FTC. And um, please register for our next session, which again is October twentieth. Thinking outside the blocks with Lego. 
Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Phyllis. I really appreciate you um, being here today. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Dara. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.